Pop Magic, Chapter 9. Greta often wished that she could hear more about the persons she met or saw or became inter interested in at Blue Cove. Sometimes things happened while she was there that were as exciting as a cinema. And she felt as she did once or twice when she had had to leave the before a picture was finished. Sometimes it was like stepping into a cinema near the end of a picture when she could only guess at all that had gone before. The morals were willing enough to answer questions, but often Greta had a queer feeling that even they might not know the answers. Perhaps she herself sometimes knew better than they. Surely this was true about Anne, and it was true too about the widow of Captain Cornwall. Leela Cornwall was a favorite topic of conversation. Among the women who brought their knitting or mending over to Mrs. Morrill's pleasant kitchen on foggy afternoons. At such times, Greta would sit on the floor with Princess in her lap and listen as they discussed the widow Cornwall. Leila was a rich woman now. She could even have as smart a pair of horses as Mrs. Trask's if she wished. Would she marry again, they wondered, or would she be content to stay on in her girlhood home and grow old, another of the solitary widows with whom the province abounds? The tongues of her neighbors might have been softer if they had known that, worn out by genuine grief, she was so soon to follow the captain over the mountain to the cemetery on the other side. But only, only Greta knew that. There were some questions that Greta was sure her father could answer. What, for instance, had happened to the village of Blue Cove itself? Prosperous villages didn't turn into a cluster of sod-covered cellar holes overnight. If some persons in such towns made fortunes and moved away, there were always others to stay on and live and die in the homes of their fathers. But it was a question she could never ask. Perhaps the strangest part of all, this queer and lovely experience was that she was sure in her heart that her father as a boy had known Blue Cove as she knew it. She had caught a look on his face sometimes when she had come home in the early dusk of a foggy day that was more than welcome. It was more like the way her mother had looked when Greta had come home once from a visit to grandmother's. An eager look, begging for news of loved ones. Once, too, father had brought some gen gentians from a trip inland. Her eyes were as blue as the get gentian, he quoted, and then added, Did you ever see eyes as blue as the gentian, Greta? Never except Mrs. Morrill's. Greta had answered without thinking and caught her breath for fear. He would ask some embarrassing questions, but he didn't. Still, why had she been so sure that he heard and understood and was pleased? His only reply had been to tell her quite casually that the gentians would look well in the pink luster picture. But Greta seldom wasted time in wondering. She was busy and happy in clear weather. And if the strange fog, born as it was of the northern ice and the tropic sea, had a magic power to enfold her in another life, she saw no need to be anything but happy there too. He's a bug. <laughs> it was very pleasant to find Retha waiting for her at the Sentinel Rocks one day and looking unusually excited for such a quiet girl. I just couldn't have borne it if you had to come today, were her first words. What do you think's happened, she went on. She gave Greta no chance to speak. Mrs. Stanton is back from Halifax. She's at Mrs. Trask's and she's coming over to tea. Greta was just as excited. Did she see the Duke of Kent, she asked? We don't know, but she must have because she looks so happy. Anyhow, she laughed when Mother asked her. And now you'll be here when she tells us about it. I've got to hurry right back. I promised Mother I'd butter the bread for tea. She will slice it because I never can get it thin enough. And you can help me butter it. We'll need loads of it because everybody's coming. They raced on down the old road together and turned into the village street. Anthony was peering out between the pickets in his fence corner with such a piercing look that Retha stopped suddenly. She always treated him as if he could hear and understand. <laughs> 
Mrs. Stanton has come back from Halifax, Anthony, she said distinctly, and in that louder tone he, we always use to foreigners. We don't know for sure, but we think she got what she went after. Anyhow, I'll tell you tomorrow. A little flicker of a smile lightened Anthony's somber face. Greta could not tell whether it meant that he had understood or whether it was merely his response to a friendly gesture. Indoors, Mrs. Morrill had opened the parlor and was putting little touches to her spotless house. The butter had been brought up from the cellar to soften, and preserves and dishes of candied ginger were set out. The delicate task of buttering the thin slices of soft bread kept both girls busy until after the guests had begun to arrive. All of the neighbors were there who had been there on that Sunday afternoon when Mrs. Stanton had stopped on her way to Halifax. There were others besides that, so that the parlor was filled, and some even sat in the kitchen. Mrs. Trask, impatient as always with any preliminary conversation, said briskly, Well, artist, did you see the Duke? Mrs. Stanton nodded happily. Yes, she said, I saw him, and paused. Well, go on, artist Stanton, Mrs. Task Trask bade. We aim to hear more than that. You stood and gaped at him. Even a cat can look at a queen. <laughs> Mrs. Stanton only laughed. I must tell my story in my own way, Harriet Trask, she said. You always did hurry me. In school, you stood better than I did, and I always thought it was because you never gave me a chance to answer. The others laughed, too. Take your own time, artist, Stella Denton said. Like as not, we'll survive the suspense even if it doesn't seem possible now. I reached Halifax pretty well worn out, Mrs. Stanton began slowly, but you wouldn't be so much interested in what happened to me on the way. I walked most of it. Oh, I had a few rides, but it seemed best to save what money I had for food and decent lodgings. And at Annapolis Royal and at Windsor, I had friends to stop with so I could rest up and start out fresh again. I told you when I was here that I had a plan for seeing the Duke. I hardly dared hope it would work, but it did. Old Mr. Blackthorne down on the island has a grandniece in service in Government House, and he gave me a note to her. She turned out to be a pleasant girl, and she promised to help me. Now, this was my plan. Somehow, I had to get into Government House when there was a party, and somehow I had to be presented to His Highness. I knew there was no use in applying for an audience on business. I'd never have got past all the guards and aides and secretaries with my clothes and my story. <clears throat> no, nor with my wrinkles either, but I had one dress, my wedding dress. My grandfather bought that ivory silk all the way from China for my 16th birthday. He said that it was to be laid aside for my wedding dress. I remember mother thought it wasn't suitable and that it was too elegant. But when I came to get married two years later, grandfather made quite a fuss. She finally let me use it. That was, a lo that was as lovely a length of silk as ever came out of the East, artist, Mrs. Denton interrupted. Captain Dakin must have enjoyed picking it out. But then he always favored you. I guess he must have, Mrs. Denton agreed. I used to tell mother that she was just a mite envious of that silk. Of course, I knew she wasn't, but you know how proper she always was. I know everything had to be what she called suitable. And that ivory brocade, she said, was only suitable, suitable for a court ball. Well, one day last winter, when it seemed that I'd reached about reached the end of my strength, I went into my room and took my wedding dress out of the chest. It was the only pretty thing I had left, and it used to rest me to sit and hold it. It took me back, but you know how that, how that is. A dress you've worn and been happy in always gathers in and holds a sort of fragrance of happiness. I got to thinking about grandmother and grandfather and mother had argued about using that silk for my wedding. All at once it came to me that mother had said about its being suitable for a court, a court ball. I made up my mind. I'd see the Duke of Kent in that dress. The women all laughed. 
young Prince Edward, Duke of Kent, and the king's own son, who had just come out to the province, had shown a marked preference for ladies who were beautiful, even as far from Halifax as the islands off the neck. Stories of his taste for beauty had spread. Well, I can, I call that using the wits the Lord gave you, Mrs. Trask laughed. Go on, artist. How did you contrive to do it? I knew I'd have to dress inside of Government House, Mrs. Stanton continued. If I was to arrive on foot and unescorted, the guards would be sure to question me. Besides, I had no proper wrap to wear. And I couldn't flounce through the streets of Halifax in my brocade. And there's where Cynthia Blackthorne helped. She got, had got a cousin of hers to give me lodging. One night when she went back to Government House after her time off, she took my package along. She smuggled it in and hid it in one of the linen presses. I had to wait nearly a week before my chance came. It would never do to risk my plan on a small affair. But I watched the bulletin of news from Government House and Cynthia listened to all the inside chatter until a truly big ball was announced. Why, there were to be guests from as far away as Shelbourne and Digby. When the night came, Cynthia smuggled me in tucked me into a clothes press and brought me my gown. Poor young one, she was excited as a child at the idea of my masquerading as a guest. But scared too, such a prank might well have lost her her place. Well, I smoothed my hair, changed in the dark and waited. When Cynthia came for me, she was laughing. She was holding a perfect yellow rose. It must have dropped from some lady's bouquet, and I took it as a sign that my plan was going to succeed. I knew it would. I slipped the rose into the coil of my hair, and it was all I needed with, gra with grandmother's earrings. Cynthia said that his highness was expected at any moment. <clears throat> he was driving down from his estate up at Bedford on the basin, and the outrider had just ridden in with word that the coach had started. The guests were lining up in the hall. Cynthia took me down a little stair that came out near the foot of the grand staircase. I elbowed my way as politely as I could into the front line. I wasn't one to risk failure by hanging back now. So I kept my eyes fixed on the entrance and pretended I didn't hear that indignant little snorts and questions of the ladies around me. Oh, I wish you could have all have seen that hall lights, music, flowers, mirrors, and silks. It was all I could do to keep my head. His Highness arrived just in time to keep me from swooning, I guess, from something like intoxication. He is a handsome young man, tall and slender as a prince should be. And bowing and smiling, he was a fine sight. The line swept into a deep curtsy with a swish of silk that almost drowned out the violins. When he came to me, I edged out a few inches, and I saw to it that I caught his eye. He gave me a sharp glance, and I could tell that he had marked me. When he passed by and the lines broken up and surged up the staircase to the ballroom, I declare I think my heart stopped beating. I tried to act as if I belonged there, and as if my escort had only just left me for a moment. I don't know how long it was before I felt a touch on my arm. His Highness had sent an aide for me. He wished to be presented. The women had dropped their knitting. They were listening, spellbound, seeing in their minds the vivid, colorful picture of a grand ball. I had caught his eye. Now I knew I must catch his ear, Mrs. Stanton went on. I gave him no chance to discover for himself that I was an imposter. I told him at once that I came uninvited, but that I had walked 200 miles to see him and to get justice, that I trusted him to help me. He was surprised, flattered, perhaps. He hesitated just a moment and frowned a little. Then he smiled, bowed graciously, and directed his aide to take me to a reception room to wait his leisure to hear my story. I must have waited two hours in, that, in what seemed like another world. There was a French window in the room and it opened on the gardens. I could hear the music from the ballroom. Once a servant came with refreshments, his highness had not forgotten me. When he came at last, he was in good humor, gay and interested. There was an officer with him and a secretary to take notes. He heard me through, asked a few questions, assured me that he believed me. 
that he would investigate and see that justice was done. Where was I staying? I gave my address. Would it be convenient for me to remain in Halifax for a short time until he can confer with Governor Wentworth and have this necessary papers prepared? I assured him it would. Good, he would attend to it at once. And now would I care to mingle with the guests or prefer to have his aide escort me home? I should prefer to leave at once, I told him, and the interview was over. Every woman in Laura Morrill's parlor gave a little sigh of satisfaction. And the papers actually came, they asked? Yes, less than a week later, Mrs. Stanton told them. An aide brought them with a bouquet, a purse, to defray the expenses of the journey, and a note from His Highness to the effect that he hoped to take a cruise around the province in the zebra the following spring, and would at that time assure himself that I was happily in possession of my property. But here they are, the note and the papers, Read them yourselves. I pressed a few of the flowers, too, to persuade myself and the children that it all happened. Well, the young man certainly does nothing by halves, said Harriet Trask. Artist Stanton, old Mrs. Morehouse's cool voice broke in on the chatter and questions that filled the room as the women examined the note and the papers with their crests and seals. Artist Stanton, I've told you that you were the loveliest bride I ever saw in my lifetime. I'd like to see you again as you looked on your wedding day in your ivy, ivory brocade. Will you put it on, my dear? Mrs. Stanton looked startled, but the others urged. Why, I'd just as leave, she said. I won't take but a minute. No, don't you bother to come with me, Harriet. To Mrs. Trask, I can manage alone. I had to at the government house, you know. As soon as she was safely out of hearing, Mrs. Denton said, Isn't there something we can do to celebrate? It seems as if this was an occasion to remember after all Hardis's hard times. We can have candlelight, can't we, Laura? Mrs. Morehouse asked Mrs. Morrow. There was candlelight for her wedding, and her ivory gown and ivory skin will look their best by candlelight. Of course we can, Mrs. Morehouse. Will you all help? The extra candlesticks stand in the bottom of the corner cupboard. Just put them around everywhere, and Retha, run over to the Saunders. If Grandfather Saunders is home, Ask him to come quick with his fiddle. Greta, you come with me and we'll pick honeysuckle. Get out all the ginger jars and bowls you can find, Stella. She called back to Mrs. Denton and fill them with water. The honeysuckle vine that covered the east side of the house was in full bloom. Mrs. Morrill stood on a cask and cut long sprays of the red and yellow blossoms with a lavish hand. She sent Greta hurrying indoors with armfuls. These are for the ginger jars. She told her, tell Stella Stenton to arrange them. When Greta returned, she found Mrs. Morrill shaping more of the blossoms into a stiff old fashioned bouquet. This will have to serve as the bride's bouquet, she said. I'm sorry it hasn't a lace frill, but it will blend well with the ivory brocade at any rate. Run back, Greta, so you can see artists when she comes. I'll take this to her. Greta slipped back into the house, all in the moment it had been transformed. A dozen twinkling candles had worked their magic. Clusters of red and yellow honeysuckle, as foreign as the ginger jars that held it, trailed from familiar shelves and cupboards and filled the room with a heavy perfume. A door closed nearby, shh, someone said, and they all stood quietly. There was a sound of footsteps and then artist Stanton appeared. From somewhere out and back, Grandfather Saunders was playing softly on his fiddle. <coughs> Framed in the doorway, Mrs. Stanton stood facing her old neighbors and girlhood friends. She hardly knew whether to laugh or cry, and the little half-smile on her face was becoming. It softened and gentled the lines that bitterness had carved. Curious gold earrings that reached almost to her shoulders hung from under the smooth sweep of black hair, and her roughened hands were hidden by lace mitts and by the round bouquet of honeysuckle. But the ivory brocade... It seemed to glow with a light all its own, to give off a soft radiance that some of the, like some of the strange creatures of the sea. Greta could see how it must have bewitched the old sea captain, bargaining for it in some dim Canton warehouse. No wonder it had arrested, if not bewitched, the young Duke of Kent. Mrs. Trask put into words what she and the others were thinking. I declare, artist, you are a beauty still.
and I'm not surprised you came back with the papers. The Duke would have had to be blind in both eyes not to relish the picture you make in that gown. But Mrs. Stanton was very near tears. Her mind had gone back beyond her recent triumph. She was thinking of the day of her wedding, when she had stepped out in her bridal gown with fine Aubrey Stanton at her side and all life ahead of them. Old Mrs. Morehouse had the gift of seeing with her heart as well as her eyes. Her mind, too, had traveled swiftly back, past the scene in Halifax, to the girlhood of Artis Stanton. Artis, she said, Aubrey Stanton would be as proud of you today as he was 15 years ago when he saw you first in that gown. Yes, and more so, my dear. The courage of a fine woman is more in the sight of God and men than the beauty of a lovely girl, and the Aubrey Stanton would be one to know it. Mrs. Stanton sent her a grateful look that said more than any words she could force to her lips. She smiled through her tears. The moment of reminiscence was folded away, not to be forgotten, but to be stored with the other treasured moments of the ivory brocade held in its luminous folds. A pleasant little breeze of conversation broke out. Grandfather Sa Saunders swung into a gayer tune, and there was soft laughter and the gentle clatter of tea things. Greta looked slowly from one face to another in the room. Never before had she seen so many of the folk of Blue Cove together. Never before had she felt so close to them, so much a part of their life as she did today in this candlelit room. When her eyes reached Mrs. Morrill, she found that she was beckoning to her. Greta slipped over to her side, and Mrs. Morrill drew her close for, to her for a moment. I'm glad you have you have been here today, she said, but the wind has changed, Greta. It will blow off the fog in another half hour. You had best be on your way over the mountain. I am sorry you can't stay to have tea with us, but I'll give you some bread and butter with a bit of the wild strawberry preserves to eat as you go. She went to the door with her. Greta stood outside looking down at the marking on the curious stone slab that lay in front of the door. She never could find words somehow to say goodbye to Mrs. Morrill, perhaps because the only words that wanted to come to her lips were always, shall I see you again? Mrs. Morrill tilted Greta's chin up in a quick gesture. Greta looked into the clear blue eyes, so like the eyes of the old sea captains who looked on far horizons. You know, I wouldn't send you away if I could help it, Greta, Mrs. Morrill said quietly. And then she added, I wouldn't send you away ever. Go now, my dear, quickly. Greta turned at the end of the street to wave. The changing wind was blowing the fog in thick swirls along the street. She could see that Mrs. Morrill was still standing at the door, but a figure was blurred and indistinct, already merging into mystery. Greta did not look back again. She wanted to keep in her heart the picture of that gay room filled with happy, kindly women in their rustling best silks. But most of all, she wanted to keep the picture of Laura Morrill standing in her doorway and seeing her off. She felt that she could never bear to lose that. She hurried out into the old road and followed it upward over the mountain.